There is, there is an extra handout tonight back there. <coughs> it just has a couple of passages printed on it, but I thought it might be handy so you don't have to flip back and forth between them. We're going to be looking at them. Um, but we're glad you're able to be here. Let's begin with prayer. Holy Father, we bow in your presence, we praise your name, and we're thankful to be your servants and uh, to have time to build one another up and and to learn from your word. We pray you bless this time and pray a special blessing on those uh, this week that are suffering, they've lost loved ones, the Dossett family and the McCarran family and any other who might not know about others that are sick or have surgery coming up or something like that. We pray your blessings and help us to be of, of help to all these folks. Thank you for always hearing us and, and answering our prayers. Um, help us to be accepting of your answers and just help us to focus for a few minutes tonight on these great portions of your word. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are studying uh, the book of Acts, and we are um, sort of introducing a lot of it before we get into the, you know, chapter one, that kind of thing, although we've read from several sections. Um, Talked a little bit about Luke, the author, last week. And tonight I want to start with uh, these opening sections of Luke's two books. So Luke obviously writes Luke, and then he writes this book, Acts. And the opening four verses of the Gospel of Luke and the opening five verses of the book of Acts are obviously prefaces or, or introduction sections to to these works, and they have similar elements that are helpful to us in understanding what's going on uh, in in these books. And I I want us to read those and reflect on them for a while this evening. I'm gonna read the, uh, the, I'm I'm looking at this handout, but I mean you can look at your Bible, however you wanna do it. I'm going to read the one from Luke, and then if I could have a volunteer to read the one from Acts. I just want us to focus on these words and sort of seek out uh, what, we, what we can gather from these introductions. So Luke 1, 1 to 4 begins, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. All right, so that is the introduction to Luke, would someone read the, the opening of Acts there for us, Acts 1, 1 to 5? In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself Staying with him, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. All right, thank you. Okay, so let's think about these these sections for 
few minutes. Uh, now apparently Luke had a sponsor, uh, we might call him a sponsor for this two volume work. What's this name that occurs here in both sections? Theophilus, right? Both of them, these opening sections are addressed to Theophilus. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, we, don't, we never have Luke, <laughs> Luke's name, although we, you know, assume authorship and that's, that's a, you know, that's, that's who wrote it. But we have Theophilus here at the beginning. And uh, his name is interesting because it means one who loves God. Pretty good name. Theo, Phileo, lover of God, one who loves God. And a lot of people refer to him as maybe a sponsor of Luke's work. That was sort of common in, in the world at that time. You know, you didn't uh, publish a book through a publishing house. You know, it wasn't Baker Books or, or whatever, but you had a benefactor, a sponsor, uh, if it was a book that, that needed support in being published, that kind of thing. Um, but here, here, here you have this Theophilus, and you know, we don't hear about him anyplace else in Scripture, so we don't know a whole lot about him. We can surmise some things. Is there any, anything else um, other than his name uh, that describes him here in either of these opening sections? Any modifiers of the name Theophilus? Most excellent, most excellent Theophilus, depending on the translation, something like that. That's in uh, Luke chapter one, verse three. And that's actually a word we can get some information on from Roman society. So it's sort of a technical term in that world, in, in the Roman Empire, um, for um, a person that is probably wealthy because they're a nobleman. So um, it's actually a term, if you're familiar with Roman rank and, and so forth, uh, we, you've heard of people that were senators, okay, in that kind of level, that's way up there, right? Just below the emperor or whoever, to be a senator in Rome is, is a high position of power. This, this word translated, uh, most excellent is right below Senate level in Roman society. So you imagine that that is a pretty wealthy, influential, powerful individual, at least. Um, assuming that Luke uses that term the way it was used in the, in the world at that time. So if, if he is a sponsor, that makes sense, right? It's, he's somebody of means. Um, we don't know how. Uh, Luke and, and he are tied, you know, how that comes about, anything like that. Uh, but it would make sense he would be the type of person who could probably sponsor such a, such a work. Um, a lot of people think that there, there are hints that maybe uh, Theophilus is sort of a new Christian, or maybe even, maybe not a Christian yet, but very interested. Okay, so you, as you look down through the things that Luke writes in these sections, why do you think some might believe that idea that he's a new Christian or he's somebody that's really interested in the story of Christ? Anything that would lead, lead to that? And what, what it says here? Okay, so that tells us something about Theophilus. He's been taught. We don't know how much he's been taught, but he's been taught, and Luke wants him to have confidence, certainty in what he's been taught. All right, so it might give us an idea of, at least with relation to Theophilus, what he's hoping to accomplish. Anything else? Um, that you see that might be a hint for you? Uh, 
Well, we'll, we'll um, transition a little bit here in our look at these. As you read what Luke writes, can you pull anything out that tells you his, his method of writing these things? That is, what were some methods or tools he used to be able to write Luke and Acts? You see anything in there? Eyewitness testimony? That would probably tell us that Luke wasn't an eyewitness, right? Because he's dependent on eyewitness testimony. Okay? That would be, you know, that would be a great method if you could access eyewitnesses and you're trying to tell the story of Jesus in the gospel and then the story of the early church to, to have access to eyewitnesses? Certainly. Anything else that was sort of, if you think about how he put this all together, you know, in addition to obviously the Holy Spirit, <laughs> okay, that's a given. It's scripture, it's inspired of the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't mean that the authors had no part in it, obviously because of what he writes here. He says some things about his activity. Other things are, are being written, right? And I assume that would mean Luke has consulted those things. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. And then he mentions the eyewitnesses. He mentions another group right after the eyewitnesses that would have been a source of information. Ministers of the word. You know, they've delivered the message to us. All right. What's he say in verse 3 about what he did? And we're in Luke 1, verse 3. Has Luke done any work? I mean, this isn't just a matter of Holy Spirit download. And Luke, by dictation, writes it all down. He wouldn't have had to research and carefully follow and talk to eyewitnesses if it was just a matter of download the files and then write them out. That's not, that's not what whole, uh, inspiration was like. Luke has followed all things carefully for some time past. Right? And this should all be faith building in us too to, to realize here's a careful researcher who knew the eyewitnesses and heard the early preachers and was very diligent about studying it out and making sure he had it right. Because he want, what kind of uh, account is he wanting to, to write for most excellent Theophilus? What does he say there? Say it again? Orderly. Not just haphazard. <laughs> uh, an orderly account. Most excellent. Yeah. Luke was careful in his research and in his presentation. All right. He, and, and that's why, you know, when we have four Gospels, when we read them, they're not the exact same thing. Right? They're talking about the same person, but they have select different stories and and. A, and sometimes they tell the same story with different details, right? So uh, I think this applies to all the writers, but we know for sure to Luke, he, he's wanting to write an orderly account that would develop faith in Theophilus, um, compile a narrative, offer certainty, okay? So, you know, these are more than just a few verses you have to get through to get on to the good stuff. This is uh, really important. Uh, we get some 
insight into what's going on behind the scenes in, in composing this. All right. And then in the opening to Acts, as he refers back to the first book, in the first book, O Theophilus, what did he say he did in the first book? So if we are studying Luke, that is the Gospel of Luke, um, what does Luke say was in the first book? What did he deal with there? Things Jesus did and taught. Things Jesus did. There's another word there too. I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do. What does that imply? If he, he, all that he began to do, but he's writing in Acts. What do you think we might be getting in Acts? <laughs> what he's continuing to do, right? So I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do to teach and teach in, in Luke. And we might understand then that what we're going to get in Acts is what Jesus is continuing to do. I mean, the Lord is alive, and he's active in, in the beginning of his church. And so, uh, that gives us a little bit of uh, preview of what's coming up. And then he talks a little bit about the uh, parameters of that, all he began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. What's that a reference to? When Jesus is taken up, what do we usually call that? The ascension, right? After he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And he talks about his, the 40 days um, where he presented himself alive after the resurrection. And, and um, even mentions John the Baptist and his work there in the opening to Acts. So there's a lot of information in these nine or ten verses uh, about, uh, about Luke and his work and his purposes, all right? Where do we get the title of, uh, of Acts? What's, what's usually the full title of Acts? Acts of the Apostles, right? If you have the Bible open to that first page. It usually says something like Acts of the Apostles. Where do we get the title Acts of the Apostles? Because if we just read the text, it doesn't appear in the verses, right? That title. Um, where, where does the title come? The title is really man-made. That is... It comes after the writing. It's not like Luke plastered that title on his first edition. Um, it's, it's a descriptive title. It's not original to Luke, as far as we know. But it's sort of added at some point to describe the contents of the book. So act, the Acts of the Apostles, uh, it being later... <laughs> Um, and you know, not from the inspired writer, we might quibble with the title. We might think of other titles that, that could be. You know, the, the titles aren't inspired. So we're not violating uh, scripture to, to, to question. There have been people that, that have suggested other titles like uh, the Acts of the Apostles is, is a possibility, but what about the Acts of the Holy Spirit? If we really get more about the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts than the apostles. We get a couple of apostles, but a bunch of them we don't hear anything about in the book of Acts. So it's not the acts of all the apostles. It's the acts of a select few, very important. But every time one of these uh, personalities in the book does something or, or some new movement in the church happens, it inevitably says 
the Holy Spirit sent. The Holy Spirit empowered. The Holy Spirit inspired throughout the book of Acts. So, so people said it, it's more about the Holy Spirit. You know? And the Holy Spirit is the way that Jesus is continuing to uh, do and teach in the period of the early church. Wasn't that what Jesus said he was going to do? You know, he said, I must, go, I must go away so I can send the Comforter, so I can send the Spirit. So there's this transition after Jesus ascends back to the Father, the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles and disciples in, in Acts chapter 2, and then we start hearing about the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, and, and His work. So some, some think about Acts of the Holy Spirit, or I, I like the, the one suggestion I read, somebody said, how about what Jesus continued to do and teach as a title? Something like that. Uh, but just to point out, you know, the Acts, I mean, that's how we know it, but um, that's not necessarily the, uh, the original title. It probably did not have a title. Um, but this, it's interesting, if you study uh, the, that first century, first, second century, this kind of writing was pretty common. Uh, this, you know, we use the term genre. That this type of writing that Acts is was, was pretty common, and that is there are books that describe the great deeds of people or uh, even of cities. They would write books about a, maybe Antioch or Rome or, or whatever and extol the great deeds of, of the city or individuals or groups of people. Um, this is Acts-type literature. And... Um, so uh, this was, you know, if you went to um, Brentano's in the first century, or, or what, is Brentano still a bookstore? Is it still open? Do we have bookstores anymore? Anyway, if you went, uh, they'd have a section of this kind of books that, are, that were published in, in that time period. Um, who were the apostles talked about in Acts? We mentioned just... Just a couple. Who are our apostles? Peter? Peter and Paul, basically. That, that's the two major ones. Um, we don't hear about you know, the others much at all. I mean, I don't think they retired. And, and tradition tells us that they, they traveled and preached in a lot of places. Now, we don't know, you know how much to trust all those traditions. There are stories about all of them as, as to where they went and how the, they met their end. Like, um, you know, 11 out of 12 supposedly martyred in one way or another. Um, just one dying of old age. That's John. By tradition, okay. Uh, but they don't, we just don't have, it'd be a much bigger book, wouldn't it, if we had all the stories of, of all their works. And it'd be exciting to know, and, and uh, one day I think we will know. But we just don't have that uh, as far as inspired scripture. Okay, when was, when was this written? That's always a big debate. You know, a lot of times when we introduce a book, we talk about the date and uh, there's all kinds of ideas. I, I think you know, look, the tendency in scholarship on, on the New Testament books and the Old Testament books is to suggest very late dates. They like to push it way off into the future when, when these guys wrote these things, usually because they're not comfortable with miraculous things. And, you know, if, if an for instance, an Old Testament prophet like Daniel who spoke of things up into the New Testament period. They want to make Daniel way up nearly into the New Testament because you can't imagine that a guy could actually predict these things, right? So a lot of times they want to make it very late, uh, but there's a lot of reasons to believe that, that Acts is much earlier than, 
what a lot of people say. So you remember how the book ends? What's going on in chapter 28 of Acts? Paul is a prisoner in Rome, right? And so, um, and, and it ends with him there, right? Somebody said, instead of um, the book ending with a period, uh, Luke ends it with a dot, dot, dot. Like, to be continued, because we don't get the, the rest of the story of Paul. Uh, but if we can pretty well date when Paul was a prisoner in Rome by a a long list of uh, data points. Uh, that would be somewhere in the early 60s AD, so 60, 61, 62 AD is when Paul is imprisoned in Rome. And, and a lot of people who believe in an early date uh, like I do would, would date Acts during Paul's Roman imprisonment because he ends the story with Paul, with Paul in Rome, all right? And, uh, Eventually, Paul gets out of that imprisonment. I mean, we think he travels more and does more missionary work. We don't know what or where, but for a period of time, maybe a couple of years, he travels some more, and then he's arrested again and re-imprisoned. So when we read his last work, Second Timothy, he's obviously back in prison, and he thinks he's just about to die. So, uh, earlier than that, it would make sense that, that Luke finished this, this work, volume two of his work. Um, so somewhere in the early 60s would be that idea. And then a little bit about the nature of the book, uh, the historical nature of the book. A lot of times when we uh, categorize the books in the New Testament, We'll say Gospels, letters, prophecy at the end, and revelation. What do we usually categorize Acts as? It's our history, right? History. It's, it's history. It certainly is historical. It's interesting that um, what does Luke call it in, in what we read earlier? He, he uses a term for what he's doing. Right at the beginning of, of the Luke passage, what, what kind of writing is he, is he saying people are doing? A letter. letter or a book, a narrative, right? Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. Narrative is story. And not in the sense of once upon a time story, but like a true telling of events, but in a story form. You know, Acts isn't a bunch of bullet points. Act, you know, the day of, day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. You know, fact. Right? But it tells us about that thing, what it was like. Um, so Luke refers to it as, as a narrative. And if we think about history, like, like we've already pointed out, it's certainly not comprehensive history. It doesn't tell us everything. It leaves out a bunch of the apostles that were, if it's the Acts of the Apostles, we only get a couple of the apostles. Um, it's not everything. Um, and we don't even get the story of every early mission effort. We get mostly Paul and his work. These other guys were going out too. Wouldn't you love to know the details of, of, of all the mission? And that'd be just wonderful to, to know what they did, but we don't have that. And we really don't have a lot of, of it outside of the Bible either. Interestingly, uh, we have you know, some sometimes legends and things like that. But um, not a comprehensive, it's sort of a focused history uh, in, in story form, focuses on the start of the church in Jerusalem, right? The beginning of the church, the first day, and then the, the early, earliest years, the earliest mission efforts. Um, 
So maybe about 30 years time period uh, is covered. And um, as we've already talked about, two main individuals, right? Peter in the first half, Paul in the second half. And really a major focus on Paul's travels in, in the missionary journeys. There's a lot of other things that happened to Paul we don't know about. Right? There's three years he talks about. Well, we don't know much that happened to this. And there's 14 years before he goes on the missionary journey. We don't know a lot about what happened in those years. Okay, so it's not telling us everything that happened. It's selected. It's, it's focused. And, um, and then also think about all the churches that are left out of the story. We get... We get to talk about the, the Jerusalem church, and we have some references to the church in Antioch and, and some other places, but you know, were there no churches up in Galilee? You know, that's where Jesus spent his, much of his ministry. Were there no churches up? We don't know anything about the churches up there. People weren't traveling to Jerusalem for church every Sunday, <laughs> you know? Uh, what, you know, what about in Egypt? We know there had to be churches there because of all the developments after the time of the, the first century. We know the church was down there. They were producing writings and, and leaders and so forth, but we don't know anything about it. And, and then don't know a whole lot about Rome other than Paul's letter. But we know that the church was there and Paul was in prison there. So it's sort of fascinating. You know. And maybe we understand why it's not there because it would be such a massive volume. And, and Luke has a purpose guided by God in what needed to be recorded for us. Okay, so we have what we need. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying when we call it history, we shouldn't think that this is um, all, that, all that went on. And we've got a a lot more stories to learn on the other side of, of time. Um, okay, thoughts or comments on, on any of that, que questions you might have? Got about five minutes or so left. Yes, Tom? Sure, yes, sir. Jeroboam? Well, that's a lot earlier than the churches, of course. That's in the Old Testament kings. You're talking about King Jeroboam. Um, well, not churches, the way we think of churches, but we know that there were Jew, a lot of Jews down there in Egypt. Um, and so that's another reason why there would have been eventually churches because the churches sort of went first to the synagogues and the Jewish populations and preached the gospel. So uh, there were, I don't know how or what Jews went, went to Egypt, but a lot of them did. They, one of the neat things about stuff in Egypt is we, get, we find a lot of their writings because of the dry climate in Egypt a lot of the writings in other places, we, it, you know, in a more moist uh, climate, they don't survive, but these papyri in Egypt do. And so those writings reveal to us that there were a, a, a large Jewish population down there. So I think your point about were Jews down there, definitely. And that probably helped the church go down there eventually. Um, because that's, you know, if you think about preaching the gospel to people, why would, why would you want to start with the Jews? If you wanted to preach to people about God, why start with Jews if you're a Christian missionary? 
they knew the Bible, what do they already believe in? One God. Everybody else believes in a bunch of them, right? And so you don't have to fight that battle. And they believe in the, the old scriptures, and they believe in one God, so naturally you'd want to go there. And Paul always did that. He always went to the Jews first. And then, as we said, I think last week, as soon as he started baptizing people in the synagogue, then there was a problem. <laughs> and persecution would start. Uh, it's a much different prospect to teach Gentiles the gospel. Right? Because you've got to tell them a hard truth. There's only one God. Not, not 300. And I guess I'm, I'm already sitting on my soapbox. But I wonder, I've wondered through the years if, if we don't struggle with this point some too in our evangelism efforts because we, uh, we sort of assumed that we were preaching to Jews in our culture. That is people who believe in one God and the scriptures. And, and we developed our outreach methods based on that when really we're preaching to Gentiles in this culture now. Um, you know, we can't assume that people know the scriptures or believe in any true sense in one God. We're, we're more and more pagan culture. And so be good to, to look at what Paul did in those places. Right. Now, one of the great places, um, by the way, to do that, you want, it's a short study, but go study Paul preaching in Athens in Acts chapter 17 um, and look at that sermon. It's not very long, but he's, he's preaching to, to people who don't believe in the Old Testament and um, believe in many gods. In fact, he's preaching surrounded by pagan temples. What kind of sermon does he preach? Well, he doesn't have... 55 references from the Old Testament. He doesn't say, would you turn to Jeremiah? <laughs> no. He does quote some people in that sermon. You remember who he quotes? Quotes their philosopher, their poet, right? People with whom he probably didn't agree. But stuff they knew. He has a statue of the unknown God. Yes. Right. He took something right off their street. They, in fact, they have found, archaeologists have found such an inscription in, in context like that that says, to the unknown God. Just in case they had missed one, you see. You got 500 gods, but what if we missed one? We better have a statue to the one we, we miss so we don't offend him. Because they lived in fear of the gods. Right? Um, and that was sort of their, and I think, folks, I think the people that we live among out here, though they would never claim that they bow down to false gods, I think people live in fear of the gods. They live in fear of, 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 of things, they just don't have names for it. And uh, we, we, we do well to remember that when we're trying to reach out. Okay? All right, next thing we're going to do next week is just sort of give you some, some ways that, the Paul, uh, that uh, Luke organized the material. We already talked about the first one. Remember the we sections? The we sections of Acts where Luke suddenly puts himself in the story because he was with Paul. There are about four of those. We just looked at a sample of one of them. But that's one of the things you can trace throughout the book. But there's other things like there's sections of verses where he stops and he summarizes what's been going on. The action summary sections. The most famous one being the end of Acts chapter 2. And then there's growth summary sections where he stops and says, how many people have been baptized? Uh, 
He does that several times throughout the book, but we'll look at some samplings of those, um, sort of seeing how he uh, lays out the text, and then we'll get into chapter one. All right? Thank you for being here. We will see you soon.